Back in the golden days of PC gaming, there was a lot less uniformity between various systems. There were machines with different instruction sets in their processors, machines that had substantially different graphics standards, and machines with completely different sound systems. DOS gaming had to be a one-size-fits-all that worked across a variety of hardware standards. And that's why so many of them came with a separate setup executable. With emulation, you can mitigate this somewhat. But the importance of setting up your DOS games correctly still holds true. That's why I'm making this video. To show you how to take this... ...to this. If you look again at the stills from those examples, you'll notice that one is in widescreen and the other isn't. Most DOS games didn't support widescreen resolutions, preferring the standard 4.3 format of a time. By refusing to adhere to that, the pixels are stretched out over the LCD and look squashed as a result, because of the greater width that they're being forced to cover. DOSBox can solve this by adjusting the aspect ratio. By setting that to true, you're telling DOSBox to display the game at 4.3 each time. That might not be enough though. The game may still be stretched, or could well have shrunken to the size of a postage stamp. That's why it's important to check the graphics card settings, and whether they've been told to scale properly preserving the aspect, or simply fill the entire screen with whatever's being sent its way. With the graphics card behaving correctly, you'll note that the image is still far worse than our example. There are three more things we have to adjust in order to change that. The first is the most important. We go to the game's setup files and make sure to tell it to output in VGA. There are lots of other colourful standards too, so be sure to check out what works best on a per game basis. With VGA enabled and aspect correction sorted, things are looking a lot better, but we can go even further with the graphics. The DOS box output determines what is used to render the graphics, with overlay being a common choice, but often suffering from blurriness when scaled. This choice in particular is a matter of personal taste, but I've found that both OpenGL NB and DDraw give a sharper image for me that I prefer. Since the output resolution of the game doesn't match your monitor, there are scalers. You can set this to none and let your GPU do the legwork, but you'll be missing out on the potential post-processing effects you can add during the scaling. Here's a handy image of the scalers supported by DOSBox, and how they alter Doomguy's face. Whether you feel these effects improve the game or not is subjective again, but they provide another option for a certain visual aesthetic. So the game looks much better now, but it still sounds like this. Let's fix that. Old PCs often didn't have a dedicated sound device, relying instead on the beep of a PC speaker, which ranged from tolerable to horrific depending on the sound design. Ah, my ears. The Sound Blaster is the default in DOSBox for a reason, as it became the de facto standard for sound devices over the years. You'll want some nice tasty Sound Blaster effects in game, and that'll make the world of difference. But the music is another matter entirely. A lot of sound cards use a Yamaha OPL2 or 3 chip to provide music synthesis. It sounds like this, if you select that. But there were superior options at the time in the form of wavetable sound cards and hardware add-ons, or even devices triggered by general MIDI. This sends and plays a high definition waveform instead, and is much more palatable. Many games will only support PC speaker or Sound Blaster, and not have any alternative for this. But many setup programs will support general MIDI to trigger the modern day equivalent, sound fonts. This allows you to have DOSBox send MIDI signals from the game to your modern computer, which will then send that to a sound font. By default, Windows still uses the hilariously outdated Roland GM sound font for MIDI, and many Linux systems aren't much better. But now listen to that with Maxime Abbey's Arachno sound font. Mmm, that's tasty. 
There are hundreds of setup guides as to how to get DOSBox to cooperate with the likes of Virtual MIDI, Synth, Bass MIDI, Fluid Synth and Timidity, so I'll not go into extensive detail here. We'll save that for another video. Instead, we'll move on to the third musical alternative. Games from the 80s and early 90s that predate general MIDI support may well have another option though, and it'll usually say something like Roland or MT32 in the setup program. This utilises a piece of hardware I previously covered called the MT32. For this, we'll either need an original MT32 or similar Roland device from the 80s, or we use Munt. Munt is to Roland's MIDI what the previous bits of software I mentioned are to general MIDI. But unlike them, instead of requiring a sound font, it needs the original ROM from the hardware itself to operate. The result is profoundly different. And again, like general MIDI, there are plenty of setup guides for it no matter what your system is. While most people will prefer Sound Blaster to PC speaker, what you use for music playback is much more subjective. You may have fond memories of playing a game on a specific piece of hardware, and emulating anything else might just feel wrong. Whatever you end up choosing, the most important thing is to have that choice in the first place. And that's part of the joy of PC gaming and DOS gaming in particular. Being able to configure a game to look and sound just like you want it to, or just how you remember. 